They are among the strangest objects that could ever exist. A ghost of quantum mechanics lurking inside the universe's only true points of no return. The Planck star is a construct fundamentally unlike any other. A strange, uncollapsible mass that can stand strong against the more of a black hole. Use a telescope and they may or may not exist, but you'll certainly never see them. Use a chalkboard and an equation long enough to make a layman's head hurt and, well, they become very, very difficult to deny. In today's episode of Astrographics, we're going to explore the very nature of the Planck star, why they could exist, how it's even possible to survive in the jaws of the most ravenous beasts in the universe, and how these strange entities can reshape what we thought we knew about the future of all things. If you're familiar with how naming conventions tend to work in astrophysics, then just by presenting you the name Planck star, you should be able to tell us at least one thing about them. They were first theorized by a dude called Planck. And while this would be a fair guess, and Planck, specifically Max Carl Ernst Ludwig Planck, was a real person who's responsible for the origins of quantum theory, we're actually less interested in Planck the man than we are in Planck the constant. Planck's constant is basically a way of establishing the energy present within a photon, a massless elementary particle that is responsible for electromagnetic radiation like visible light or radio waves. Take the frequency of an electron with a high frequency corresponding to things like gamma rays or X rays and a low frequency corresponding to, say, radio waves, and multiply it by Planck's constant, and boom, you now know how much energy is contained in that electron. But here we're going to leave the work of dear old Max Planck behind, because again, we don't need him so much for his Nobel Prize winning genius here as we do for what his genius set of principles implies about our universe. And those principles actually bring us to Provence in southern France, where we find a Marseille University. There, a professor in theoretical physics named Carlo Rivelli and a then PhD student named Francesca Vedotti crossed paths, and together they decided to take some of Planck's work and use it to explore the nature of the universe's most enticing mystery, the black hole. Now, in order to really do justice to what Rivelli and Vedotto found, we first got to understand the conventional wisdom on what happens inside a black hole, which, when compared to basically the entire rest of astrophysics seems a little too neat and simple to be entirely accurate. The thinking goes, at least generally, that a black hole has two parts. Those include the event horizon, which will simplify as the black hole's surface, where gravity gets so strong that nothing can escape, and then there's the singularity, an infinitely small, infinitely dense point in the middle of the black hole where everything inside the black hole collects, maybe for all eternity, maybe till it eventually explodes. None of that is actually confirmable by by the way, in order to know any of that for sure, we'd have to measure it, and bringing any measuring instrument close enough to a black hole to measure it is a fantastic way to get swallowed up by that same black hole. We'd really strongly advise against trying it, even if it were possible, but since black holes consume and seem to destroy everything that comes their way, referred to in a technical sense as information, they violate some pretty fundamental laws of general relativity. Put simply, physicists have known for a while that black holes don't add up, but what humanity was missing was a mystery. All that is, until Ravelli and Vedato came onto the scene. According to them, the issue around black holes could be solved the same way as physicists have been working to solve the problems posed by the Big Bang, the dominant theory to explain how the whole universe came into being. Ravelli and Vedato found their inspiration in the Big Crunch theory on how the universe will end, that eventually the expansion of the universe will reverse and the whole thing will contract back in on itself, eventually reaching a black hole-like point of singularity and maybe springing back outward again. That infinite a testimony small bit of universe at the crunchiest point of the big crunch is theorized to be on the Planck scale. That is to say, the smallest possible size that an object can be before all the laws of physics start breaking down in order to accommodate it. However small you're envisioning, it is many, many orders of magnitude smaller than that. Now, we should be clear here. The big crunch is not the reigning explanation on how the universe will end or anywhere close. In fact, it's pretty much accepted that the core hypothesis is incorrect. But Ravelli and Vedotto were interested in the broader idea, that a vast cosmological body could collapse to a point where the forces of gravity were so extreme that they'd mirror those inside a black hole, and yet 
it was mathematically possible in humanity's understanding of quantum mechanics for that condensed matter to form an object of a size that was still measurable. That is to say, it wouldn't form a singularity. When they applied that same principle to a black hole, their solution was a Planck star, a structure inside the black hole itself that was made up of the information that the black hole had consumed. And again, we don't mean information here in the way, say, a computer would use binary data to represent facts. We mean information as anything that can input inside the boundary of the black hole's event horizon. Now, we won't get into why exactly that information can form a structure instead of collapsing into the singularity, other than to state that it's because of something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And astrophysics nerds, you can feel free to hit up the comments and inform people who'd like to learn more. Instead, we're going to focus on the result today. That as information travels into the black hole, it thus wouldn't condense to a point of singularity where, again, physics collapses and everything sort of goes kaput. Instead, the structure that that this information forms would be very small but still measurable. That is to say, it would be larger than the infinitely small point of a singularity. In fact, it would start only a few orders of magnitude larger than that Planck scale sized ultra condensed universe from the Big Crunch theory. And it would also be growing proportional to the amount of new information that's coming in. Although it would start out infinitesimally tiny, it wouldn't stay that way for very long, kept in its structure by a repulsive force that prevents its collapse well before a singularity ever occurs. That structured form of mass would continue to grow and grow in the space between the black holes of horizon and the singularity until the moment happens. Because of the way time works inside the event horizon of a black hole, the question of how long this process takes will have pretty radically different answers. View the process from inside, and it might take a few minutes. View it from the outside, and it might take a few billion years. Technically speaking, the simple existence of a Planck star would mean that a black hole wouldn't have an event horizon, but it would still look as if it did for outside observers like us, and <laughs> that's confusing, but you don't have to worry about it. But either way, the information that goes into the black hole is structured in a new way that prevents information loss, thus healing the gaping wound that black holes leave in the theory of general relativity. Eventually, the Planck star grows large enough that its outer boundary meets the threshold of what an external observer would perceive as the event horizon itself and in an instant, the black hole ceases to exist. What it leaves behind is nothing short of a structure that contains all the information the black hole ever swallowed. Not in its original form, but it is still there. Now look, when we peer into the innermost nature of what physicists call a Planck star, it should be apparent by now that to use the word star in this case is a little bit of a stretch. If we consider a star to be something like our sun, a giant ball of plasma superheated by billions of years of fusion reaction at its core, well, a Planck star definitely isn't that. Instead, it's a type of theorized compact exotic star, a very, very, very dense collection of matter that's formed of something other than electrons, protons, neutrons, or muons, but can still hold itself in a structure instead of collapsing completely. Alongside the Planck star are things like quark stars, strange stars, electroweak stars, boson stars, Q stars, and other forms of matter that are complicated enough to make our heads explode. In the case of a Planck star, this is a structure that will never hold planets in a celestial orbit, will never harness asteroids and comets, and will never have living beings like us living in its immediate vicinity, like the Sun has to our Earth. Except that's not entirely true, because if indeed black holes don't have true event horizons or singularities, then the Planck star is sort of but not exactly, but sort of, what the black hole actually is. But it is entirely possible for black holes, like any other celestial bodies with a gravitational pull, to host planets, asteroids, or in the case of larger black holes, even other stars in stable orbit. To any living being sitting on the fringes of a system orbiting a Planck star, the true nature of the body they orbit would likely remain a mystery to them. After all, from the outside, they'd probably think they were orbiting a black hole. The thing that's swirling around certainly looks like it has an event horizon, and if any sentient beings orbiting it have gotten to the point yet where they've figured out that Planck stars might be a thing, then they'll likely either have very little conception of what they're orbiting, or once they pick up the basics, they may figure that there's probably a singularity somewhere in there. But in reality, they may well be in a Planck star's orbit, destined to never observe it firsthand. The other especially weird thing about a Planck star 
is its lifespan. If we assume that black holes do indeed host Planck stars, then we'd deduce that the lifespan of a Planck star is on the scale of billions of years. After all, that's how long black holes' lifespans seems to last. But the truth of the matter is a little bit more complex because of a phenomenon known as gravitational time dilation. Basically, the higher mass an object is, the more time itself slows down as you get closer to it. And Planck stars are exceptionally massive for their size on account of how they're made up of all the information that a black hole ever swallowed. Get close to one, and time slows down to a degree where a billion years from our vantage point might pass in as short as a few moments from the perspective of a hypothetical observer on the surface of the Planck star. As Ravelli and Vidato themselves explained it, quoting, Time slows down near high density mass. An observer, capable of resisting the tidal forces landing on a Planck star, will find herself nearly immediately in the distant future at the time where the black hole ends its evaporation. The proper lifetime of a Planck star is short from its own perspective. The star is essentially a bounce. A Planck star is a shortcut to the distant future. Now, at this point in today's episode, we've got to reiterate that Planck stars, at least for now, are just a theory. But if we accept the basis for the theory, if we accept the idea that Planck stars might exist, then we can indulge that possibility in order to ask an equally interesting question. If Planck stars do exist, then how else would our universe change? The first major implication comes by way of Hawking radiation. First, a mere proposed solution to the problems presented by a black hole, but something that's since been observationally confirmed since the death of the theory's creator, Stephen Hawking. Hawking radiation is basically leakage of thermal radiation from black holes caused when pairs of subatomic particles, one with a positive charge and one with a negative charge, should naturally start popping up around the event horizon of a black hole. Those particles jettison away from each other, and the positively charged ones jettison outward doing what was previously considered impossible, escaping the maw of a black hole. The escape of the positively charged particle is Hawking radiation, while the travel of the negatively charged particle further into the black hole is an act that very slightly reduces the mass of the black hole itself. Repeat that interaction enough times and eventually black holes vanish in little bursts of radiation emitting all the particles that they had once swallowed. All the information that goes in gets released, and the fundamental laws of physics are no longer violated by the existence of the black hole. That process is estimated to take about 14 billion years, which conveniently enough is just a little bit younger than the age of the known universe, meaning that humanity exists at just the right time for primordial black holes to start playing out that process of collapse. But now, the addition of the Planck star as a construct inside a black hole adds a new layer of insight on what actually happens to the particles that don't get emitted during the process of Hawking radiation emission. The information, if you will, that's sacrificed to the black hole in order for positively charged Hawking radiation to escape doesn't simply disappear or cancel out something happening inside the black hole. Instead, it's either made part of the Planck star or interacts with it in some other way, helping the Planck star to grow and eventually reach the outer bounds of what seems, from the outside, to be an event horizon. Because the information in the Planck star would include all the information that was once thought to be lost via Hawking radiation, the star provides a mechanism by which that information is not destroyed. Yet again, put a Planck star between a black hole's event horizon and what was once considered its singularity, and you end up healing a major rift in our understanding of the universe. The second knock-on effect from the hypothetical existence of Planck stars follows on from the first, that we might actually be able to perceive their existence using the tools we have on Earth. That would come by way of a highly specific signature, a gamma ray that physicists hypothesize would have a wavelength of around 10 to 14 centimeters. Those particular signatures should be given off by primordial black holes as they start to deteriorate, specifically if there happens to be a Planck star enclosed inside, but not if there isn't. With those black holes now believed to be in the deterioration process, humans have come around at an optimal time to detect signals from Planck stars, and we might have already done so without fully understanding what they are. If those signals can be identified in the future, then the Planck star theory may pick up a pretty massive endorsement in short order. Then there's the way that the existence of Planck stars would impact human understanding on the universe's far future. The theory that's replaced the big crunch that we mentioned earlier explaining the end of the universe is instead known as heat death, alternatively termed the Big Chill or the Big Freeze. In the heat death theory, the universe eventually evolves to a point that as galaxies, then stars, then even particles spread outward from each other, nothing is able to interact, and processes that increase entropy, basically cosmic disorder, 
cease to take place. Everything just gets really quiet, really boring, and then nothing happens forever. This process gets pretty weird once we get towards the end of it, and some physicists even suggest that by various tricks of quantum mechanics, a new universe might end up popping up out of nowhere in roughly 10 to the 10th to the 10th to the 56th power years, so it'll be a while. But between the phase of universal evolution that exists now and the phase of evolution that we would consider heat death, there's a much longer phase in which galaxies and galaxy clusters have long since disintegrated, but their black holes still remain. In current versions of the heat death theory, the most massive of the supermassive black holes don't deteriorate until at least 10 to the 100th power years from now, perhaps not even until the 10 to 106th power years from now. Between now and then, they basically just wander through the universe, vacuuming up whatever's in their way. But if Planck stars are real and their slow, progressive gathering of information eventually leads to the dematerialization of those black holes and thus the release of all the information they've consumed, then our current vision of our galactic future does need some amending. Whether the ultimate implication here is that those black holes won't survive long enough to spend untold spans of time roving across the void, or that they'll occasionally collapse and allow localized interactions between matter long after the rest of the universe has gone quiet, we certainly aren't the ones to say. We'll leave that to the astrophysicists out there, and in fact, we'd be willing to bet that the ultimate answer will be some version of, well, both of these answers are wrong and the truth is even weirder. But regardless, if Planck stars do exist, then they are a fundamental disruption for humanity's best guess on where the universe is headed. Finally, there's one more implication of the Planck star, and that's time travel. Of course, this isn't time travel in any way that humans have imagined in literature or cinema. After all, there are a lot of issues inherent in trying to drive your DeLorean all the way down to a Planck star, and creating a DeLorean-sized Planck star on Earth would be nothing short of an apocalyptically bad idea. But even still, the existence of Planck stars are a mechanism for base particles to travel forward in time very rapidly. If you hypothetically were able to resist the spaghettification that would be involved with coming close to a blank star, and you weren't torn apart by the tidal forces on its surface, you'd only spend what you perceive to be a short amount of time in that realm before the entire thing starts to dissipate. When it does, and you're left behind in the aftermath, billions of years will have gone by. That's not a process that humans seem particularly likely to use in order to go back and see the dinosaurs anytime soon, although if someone out there has some sort of scheme to the contrary, then, well, we applaud your efforts to meddle in the space-time continuum. But what it does imply is that the tidal forces at play around a Planck star demand further study, because if anything can survive that, then it'll be able to transit incredible spans of time in the space of just a moment. Even if that's a power humanity will probably never harness directly, it's still pretty cool to know about, isn't it?